to look at reflex arcs, letter C, and then go on to spinal nerves in this section. So um, what is a reflex arc? So a reflex arc is um, only going to involve the spinal cord. So it, you, you see that there's an arc of different neurons um, synapsing here, but nothing goes to the brain immediately. There is an interneuron that can send a message to the brain eventually. Okay, so a reflex is a very quick response and um, it's evolved to give you a very immediate response to something that's painful or to some kind of harmful stimulus um, and you act before you think about it or before your brain actually gets the message. So um, there are two reflex arcs. Let's actually look at oops, a, um, this picture here. So this is a monosynaptic reflex arc. This is a polysynaptic reflex arc. So monosynaptic means one synapse. So this is a very typical, like, there's a sensory receptor. The sensory receptor senses something. In this case, it's a stretch. Okay, so there is a, so um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but if you stretch your muscles too much, there's a reflex to, to not allow them to stretch, um, to kind of contract them when they're being stretched. So what happens is this stretch will send a message into the spinal cord Right, the central nervous system, system here is the spinal cord, then synapse directly with the motor neuron. The motor neuron will then um, respond by causing the muscle to contract. So the stretch, muscle contracts. Okay, so there's nothing interrupting this. This is a very fast, uh, immediate um, reflex. In a polysynaptic reflex, this is going to involve a sensory neuron one or more interneurons. Remember these interneurons are neurons that are found in the gray matter of the spinal cord and brain and uh, but this in this case we're talking about spinal cord and it's just made to uh, make broader and uh, more connections. So um, we have this sense coming in from the skin. We are going to uh, synapse with our interneurons. The interneurons will then synapse with more than one motor neuron. And then that allows you to engage um, more than one muscle group. So this example here, okay, uh, well actually let's look at one example at a time. So let's look at the monosynaptic reflex. This is a very uh, common test that everybody's probably gotten done in their life before. And this is that knee tap, right? The doctor will hit this structure here and look, you guys know what this is now. So there's your patella, the piece of connective tissue running from the patella to the tibial tuberosity, right? That's the patella ligament. So there's a stretch receptor in this ligament. And when you hit this ligament, it'll cause that stretch receptor in the muscle and also in the ligament to come in. So you have a sensation of stretch, comes into the spinal cord. You're skipping the interneurons that are in the dorsal horn. And you're just synapsing with that motor neuron, the motor neuron will cause that one muscle group, right, very simple, to quickly contract and you get a little jerk, your, your um, patellar reflex. Okay, so you're, you're testing a spinal cord reflex and you're testing that patellar reflex. Um, the other example, oops, sorry, is going to be a polysynaptic reflex example, which is kind of like putting your hand on something painful. Maybe it's a hot stove, you didn't realize it was hot, and you pull your hand away, like you jerk your hand away immediately, and then you say to yourself, ouch, right? So that immediate um, response to the muscle was um, that, you know, you don't have that other split second to keep your hand on a hot stove or to keep your hand on a painful stimulus, you just move it, and then you know, a second later, your brain gets the message because you have this interneuron going to the brain, um, but it's secondary, okay? So there's an interneuron involved, so this is a polysynaptic reflex. So if it involves more than one muscle group, you're gonna have to have an interneuron involved, and that's gonna be polysynaptic, okay? So that's all it is. So reflexes do not involve the brain. The brain finds out a little bit later, um, but it's a protective mechanism so that you can move your body away from painful stimulus. All right, um, let's look at spinal nerves. So this is the image that's actually a nicer image and cleaner image than the ones we looked at before. So this is the 
blue are sensory neurons, either coming from the back of your body or the front of your body here. They're going to come into the rami. Uh, here's our spinal nerve. This is the dorsal root, only sensory neurons. The ventral root, the, the cell bodies of our motor neurons are here. By the way, this is a great picture of those interneurons in gray here. The interneurons are in the dorsal horn. And then in the ventral horn, you have your motor neuron cell bodies. And then the motor neuron fibers are in the ventral root. Um, and then here we can see that we have mixed structures, right? So the roots are not mixed. The spinal nerve is mixed. The rami are mixed because they have blue and red. So spinal nerves are mixed, OK? So that's the, the first number one in your outline. Spinal nerves are always mixed. Every spinal nerve in your body has a name. And uh, they're going to bring both motor commands to that region of the body that the spinal nerve innervates, and then send sensory signals back from that region of the body to your brain. Okay? So let's look at a, a nerve. This should look really familiar. This looks like a skeletal muscle. So nerves are organized the same way as your skeletal muscle. Slightly different because instead of a muscle fiber, we have an axon. So this is a nerve fiber. Right? Nerve fibers are usually myelinated if they have long ways to travel. Then they are going to be wrapped with, oops, wrapped with um, endoneurium. So the connective tissue is endo, peri, and epi, just like your muscles, but now the word neurium for nerve. So endoneurium is found between your um, axons or the fibers creating a fascicle. The connective tissue that creates that fascicle, the purple, is going to be perineurium all filling in the space with perineurium. We have blood vessels. Yes, we do have blood vessels in the nerve. And then epineurium is going to be the connective tissue on top. So very, very identical to the muscle, really. All right, so let's start, start talking. Oh, it's a pretty picture of a nerve. So let's start talking about uh, the nerves. Um, and can you guys tell the difference between these words, neuron, nerve fiber, and nerve? So a neuron is everything, right? It's the dendri it's one cell. It's the dendrites, it's the soma, it's the long axon of a cell. What's a fiber? The fiber is just the long axon of a cell, right? So one fiber is one axon. What's a nerve? This, this is a nerve, right? So a nerve is a bundle of axons running together, right? organized by connective tissue, organized uh, into fascicles with blood supply. So a nerve is a very large object. You can see nerves with your eye. Okay, so nerves have names like the sciatic nerve, like the median nerve. Okay. All right. So these are um, the, uh, let's see, let's jump down to, we talked about number three and we talked about number four. Let's talk about number five in the outline. Chap uh, 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They're all attached to the spinal cord. You have uh, eight cervical nerves, C1 through C8, 12 thoracic nerves, T1 through T12, five lumbar nerves, L1 through L5, five sacral nerves, and then one coccygeal nerve. What's interesting is this really follows the number of vertebrae that we have, um, except for the cervical region, because in the cervical region, the there's a nerve that comes above C1, and there's a nerve that goes below C1. Usually, when you start counting these, all the nerves exit below the vertebra. So T1 um, extends away through that intervertebral foramen under T1. But there's an exception here. There's one above C1 and below C1. So that's why there's an extra cranial nerve. I'm sorry, cervical nerve, not cranial nerve. OK. so. Um, if you look at the next page in your outline, what is a plexus? A plexus is this braid, right? I pointed this out in the very beginning of the lecture. So this is that interconnected um, braid, so a plexus is a braid of nerve fibers, specific nerve fiber, nerve, I should say specific nerves, that um, provide redundancy to reach an area of your body. So you have a plexus in the cervical region and the brachial region. You do not have a plexus um, for the nerves that travel along each rib. Um, remember that costal groove? These are intercostal nerves. They're going to travel in that costal groove. 
and then you have down here we have our lumbar plexus and our sacral plexus okay so the the redundancy let me just try and make this clear um, let's say that we want to you know the brachial plexus let's say moves it moves things in your arm and uh, there's one specific, specific one that goes to your your biceps so the fibers that are going to move your biceps they're going to travel in different ways to reach your biceps so if one of those ways gets uh, damaged or stopped you have alternate ways to travel to your biceps so you can continue to contract your biceps brachii even though one of the pathways has been broken so i i use traffic analogies a lot so if we wanted to go to venice beach but the 10 highway was broken uh, or you know stopped uh, we can take alternate routes there so that the braiding this plexus provides those alternate routes to to reach the same organ so that if one routes damaged we have redundancy so hopefully that makes sense to you um, we evolved these plexus to sort of provide a redundant way to get to um, a part of the body so what you're going to do is for this um, exam, your nervous system exam, you're going to need to know um, the spinal nerves that I have outlined for you in the outline that are bolded. You're going to need to know what plexus it arises from, but you do not need to know the number of the plexus. So for example, here is the cervical plexus. The cervical plexus is going to um, have the fibers C1 through C5 intertwine. You don't need to know that. Okay, so don't you don't need to know C1 through C5, but you do need to know the the one. So if you look at your outline, there's only one nerve that you need to know that arises from the cervical plexus, and that's the free neck nerve. Okay, so the free neck nerve, it's going to come from three to five, right? But um, so all of these are going to uh, eventually travel to the diaphragm. So the free neck nerve travels into the diaphragm. It not only brings sensory information to the diaphragm, but it's motor to the diaphragm. So um, one of the scary things about spinal cord injury or injury to the neck area above C3 is that if you damage really, really high up here, you're going to stop the messages reaching your diaphragm, right? There's no way you can breathe anymore because if you damage at this level, anything traveling down from the brain, right? It's not gonna be able to contract your diaphragm anymore. So you're gonna die because you can't breathe. That's why um, those, that you paralyze your diaphragm and that's not compatible with life. Okay, um, so that's the phrenic nerve. The interesting kind of fun thing about this is that for some reason, spicy foods can irritate this and uh, irritation of your phrenic nerve can cause hiccups. So um, kind of a funny thing. So spicy foods can cause hiccups and anything irritating the free nerve can cause hiccups. Um, all right, the brachial plexus. You do need to know all of these nerves that arise from the brachial plexus. And if you can remember the brachium, right, means arm, then all of these are gonna go to the shoulder and the arm. So let's look at the first one. It's the axillary nerve. So there's our axillary nerve. You also want to be able to recognize this in a diagram. So if you look at a nerve and the nerve comes away and it just stops in the shoulder, right? This, this nerve is only reaching the shoulder. That's going to be the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve is going to innervate um, muscles of the shoulder, such as the del deltoid, the teres minor. It's also going to bring any sensation from the shoulder to the brain, right? Someone taps you on the shoulder. You're going to feel that because of the axial axillary nerve. The second one down is called the musculocutaneous nerve. So the musculocutaneous nerve is going to go down the anterior uh, arm. So here's the word muscuta musculocutaneous, and this nerve is going to serve the anterior arm. So what's here? We have our biceps brachii, we have a brachialis, we have coracobrachialis, and then anything that touches or any sensation that you have here in the anterior arm is going to be carried to your brain via this musculocutaneous nerve, okay? The median nerve, letter C, the median nerve is something we've talked about before with carpal tunnel syndrome. So the median nerve is gonna come into the hand. So if you if you watch it, right, the median nerve is traveling down the, it's a nice name because median is like the middle, middle of your arm, middle of your forearm. It's gonna go in through into the hand, right, and then serve your hand. Let's look at the median nerve. The median nerve is going to set, serve the thumb, right, or I should say innervate the thumb, your index finger, your middle finger, 
okay? And then just half of that uh, digit four, I guess we can call it. Um, so this is uh, one of, the, so in carpal tunnel syndrome, if you've had it or if you know someone who's had it, they will often complain of weakness in their thumb or these two fingers because that is where the median nerve serves. And if you compress it, you'll have issues there with weakness or it can be sensation, right? You can have pain in these areas, discomfort in those areas. So that's your median nerve. The ulnar nerve, this is one that's going to hug the, um, you know, the ulnar side or the medial side of our forearm and arm. So here's our ulnar nerve. We can see it is going to be the most medial. It's going to be very superficial here. Look how it tucks back behind the elbow. So this is an interesting fact. The ulnar nerve is also called our funny bone. So when you hit your elbow, um, because there's very shallow region, this is a superficial nerve right here, you can hit this nerve. And then that tingling sensation will radiate all the way down into the hand, right? So next time you hit your funny bone, pay attention to where you find that tingling sensation. And it's going to be very heavy on this medial part of your hand, the pinky and half of that other digit four. But that's your ulnar nerve where it serves. Okay, so if you cut your pinky finger or digit five, it's the ulnar nerve that will send pain sensations up to your brain. Okay, mm, let's look at the uh, radial nerve. Okay, radial nerve is going to be um, serving the posterior side of our arm and forearm. So the radial nerve is everything in the back. Um, it's not that great of an image here. Uh, this is the posterior side, so let's find the radial nerve. The radial nerve is going to serve the triceps brachii, all of your extensors of the posterior forearm. Okay, the radial nerve is going to serve a lot of the back of your hand. Um, one interesting, um, I guess, like disorder or um, accident or injury that you can have is called radial nerve palsy, also called wrist drop or Saturday night palsy. So. Um, the word palsy is when a, a nerve doesn't work, and when the nerve doesn't work, um, it can be due to many things. It can be because you have an infection, it can be because of physical damage, and because that you cut off the blood supply. So when your leg falls asleep or your arm falls asleep um, because you've had it in this bent position for a long time, that's you're literally squeezing those blood vessels in the nerve and you're collapsing them and not allowing the nerve to be... Um, oxygenated and so the nerve just it becomes dead right so it loses feeling and then you have to um, shake it out you have to you know move your body around to get the blood flow back to get sensation back so in radial nerve palsy what happens is the um, radial nerve the reason why they call it Saturday night palsy is because you fall asleep in weird positions on Saturday night because maybe you're watching TV really late and you have your hand um, and this is actually the position that would cause it if you had your hand um, sort of behind your head, like resting your head into the crook of your your arm, that position can pinch the, the radial nerve and you can wake up with you, the, none of your extensors working. So in order for you to pick up your wrist, in order for you to just have your hand straight out at one level like this, you would have to engage your extensors. But if your extensors don't work, there's no way you can lift your wrist up. So the wrist is just going to flop like this. And so that's why it's called wrist drop. Okay, so that's the radial nerve not working. All right, let's look at some other ones. The lumbar, oh, so this is just a pretty picture of the um, brachial plexus and the cervical plexus is pretty high up, but this is the brachial plexus. So you can see how um, complicated it is. Um, and then just kind of an appreciation here, I'm not gonna go into any detail. The thorax uh, is not gonna form any plexus and you don't, you're not responsible for any specific nerves here. You just want to know the term intercostal nerve and they're going to run along the costal groove of your nerve. The um, ventral ramus, right, that branch in front will follow the rib to the anterior. It's going to serve those intercostal muscles and also come and give you sensation at that level of the rib. The dorsal ramus will go to the back and give your back muscles at the level of that rib innervation and then also sensation to the skin. Here's the lumbar plexus. So in the lumbar plexus, you're responsible for the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve. 
You don't need to find them here, but I want you to find them here. So the femoral nerve, this is a small picture, but if you look carefully, the femoral nerve is going to arise. It's going to pass the um, inguinal ligament here, and it's going to come into the thigh. So if you remember the femoral triangle, remember this was called the femoral nerve. The femoral nerve will serve all of your anterior thigh. Okay, so all the quadriceps muscles are served by the femoral nerve. Then the femoral nerve will branch, it will continue down, and it will serve the medial leg, and it's going to change name and become the saphenous nerve. Okay, the obturator nerve, letter B, is going to go through the obturator foramen. So this is actually an easy one to pick out. If you see a nerve travel through, remember this. Uh, foramen of the coxal bone is called the obturator foramen. That's the obturator nerve. So if you look at it, it's going to go to the medial thigh. So what's here? Your adductors, right? Gracilis, adductor longus, adductor brevis. That's served by the obturator nerve. Now let's look at the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve is actually, it is known as the largest nerve in the body, um, but it's a little bit of a, a trick because it's actually two nerves bundled together in one. So if you look at the outline, the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve are running inside of the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve stays one unit um, with branches as they travel down your leg, but then here it splits. So the tibial nerve, right, will travel down the tibia and remain on the posterior side of the leg. The common fibular nerve will then travel la uh, laterally to the fibula. Okay, so you want to be able to find the tibial nerve, the common fibular nerve, the sciatic nerve, and know that the sciatic nerve will serve all the posterior lower limb. So the posterior hip, the posterior thigh, the posterior leg, all the way down to your feet. So if you have uh, problems with the sciatic nerve, sensation or muscle loss or numbness uh, can be any of the path of this nerve. It can be problems with the foot, problems with the leg, problems with the thigh. All right, lastly, we have the pudendal nerve. And the pudendal nerve is pictured here. It's very small, but it's going to be a nerve that curves into the genitals. Okay, so it's going to serve the um, muscles of the pelvic floor. When you hold your urine, or um, if you have to go to the bathroom and you hold it, those muscles that you're squeezing is served by this pudendal nerve. Okay, so if you have problems with this nerve, you're going to be incontinent. Um, another interesting thing about this nerve is that they'll block it if they have to do um, surgery or sort of cesarean section or, uh, or not cesarean section, I'm sorry, but with um, childbirth, if they want to block, another way of sort of numbing this area is to block this nerve because this nerve gets sensation, or it can take sensation away from this genital region of the body. Okay, so the coccygeal nerve is, we can skip this picture. Oh, this is a really great picture of that sciatic nerve, right? So we can see how large it is. We can see the piriformis muscle. Remember that muscle that lies on top of the sciatic nerve and can be actually a cause of sciatica, that nerve traveling down here. We can also see the pudendal nerve arising and curving inwards, right? It's going to go medially towards the genitals. All right, the last topic here is going to be the dermatomes, and then we're done with this chapter. Um, what are dermatomes? So derma refers to skin and uh, tome, I don't know. So the dermatomes are just regions of the skin that are mapped out to what spinal nerve um, serves it. So let's say that you um, tap someone's shoulder, right? What spinal nerve is serving the shoulder? It's going to be C4. Um, and so you, a neurologist can use this map to um, look at abnormalities. So let's say for some reason your thumb uh, went numb, like you just can't, have, you don't have any sensation in the, the skin of the thumb. A neurologist can use this reference and say, okay, we know C6, cervical nerve six, serves the thumb. So you know that cervical nerve six is gonna travel through that median nerve. And we know that where it comes from, where it arises in the neck. So we can, if you have numbness in the thumb, the numbness can arise from anywhere in the thumb itself to the median nerve, and then also be something in um, that cervical nerve six. So maybe there's a, a tumor or something wrong in the cervical, like really close to the spinal cord or in that level of the spinal cord. So it's a really nice tool for um, neurologists to use to map out what spinal nerve serves what part of the body, but just the skin.
okay, because the word is dermatome. All right, so that's it for this chapter 14.